In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. He came into the world, just as every other baby had, born to an anxious and anticipating family, born into a world that would be filled with struggles. He was nurtured by his mother, cared for by his father, and considered as a source of joy and hope. His father Lamech called his name Noah, saying he will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands. In any life story or biography, the major events, accomplishments, and struggles are the focus. And from these accounts, we learn about a person's character and their perseverance. Yet from even the everyday details or passing references, we can learn much about a person's attitude, personality, and influence. For Noah, it was the wickedness of the world in his generation that would define the attitudes and actions of his life. The earth was corrupt before God, was filled with violence. As a result of this environment, a call to action came to Noah at the apex of his life, and it came directly from God. Make yourself an ark. This is a short directive, it may seem simple, but it would consume Noah's time and energy as he moved with godly fear to prepare an ark for the saving of his family. But this isn't where the story really begins, nor is even Noah's birth a proper place to start. First, we have to consider how the world had fallen into such awful conditions. The entrance of sin into the world by Adam and Eve was both regretted and remembered by the first couple. The Garden of Eden was a place of lush existence. It abounded with every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food. But having sinned against God, both husband and wife were sent out from the garden. They would continue their life facing the toils and struggles that had previously been unknown to them. One of the many reminders of their sin was the pain Eve would experience in childbirth. As God had pronounced, in pain you shall bring forth children. Through the pain, Eve would safely bring two sons into the world, Cain and Abel. Now the struggle of parenting would begin and bring with it new challenges. Cain, the firstborn, would grow to be a farmer, bringing forth harvests from the earth. Abel, his younger brother, would grow to become a shepherd and a keeper of flocks. While we're not told how old the two sons were, at some age of accountability, each son brought his offering in worship to God. Abel's offering of the firstborn of his flock was pleasing and respected by God. Cain's offering, though, was not in obedience to God's will, and God did not respect it. Cain's response was to become very angry and jealous. 
God placed before Cain encouragement to choose the good path. God told him plainly, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But rearing its ugly head, sin offered its evil temptations to mankind. And we see the young farmer Cain choose to maintain his attitude of jealousy and rage toward his younger brother. Then, willfully acting on these sinful desires, Cain rose up and killed Abel, committing the world's first murder. For this evil deed, Cain was banished, driven by the Lord away from his family to live as a fugitive and a wanderer. Adam and Eve were now left without sons, one murdered and the other living with the consequences of his choices. So Adam and Eve did what was necessary to continue with their lives, having faith in God's loving care and plan. In time, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, including their third son, Seth, who God had appointed as another seed in Abel's stead. Through Seth's life and lineage, the rapidly growing family of mankind began to call on the name of the Lord. Seth's godly example can be seen extending to the seventh generation from Adam, where we find the patriarch Enoch, who has been renowned in history as having faithfully walked with God. His righteous life so impressed the Creator that God ushered him from the earth without having to endure death. In the years that each of these generations were establishing their families, becoming parents to many sons and daughters, becoming uncles and aunts, grandparents, and even great-grandparents, there was another major branch of Adam and Eve's lineage that contained a growing population of people doing much of the same day-to-day -day living. While we often focus on the descendants of Seth as being sons of God, the lineage of Cain also provides a wealth of clues, both obvious and subtle, for understanding the cultural setting into which Noah would be born. Cain was not subjected to the penalty of death for having taken Abel's life. Rather, even in his banishment, God set a mark on him to warn off any in the future that might bring him harm. Therefore, Cain continued a protected life, but one that was subjected to daily struggles of survival. Cain settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden, where he lived and toiled, his struggling extended even to his own occupation of farming, where God had pronounced that his labors would no longer yield its strength to him. Over time, though, Cain would eventually marry, a descendant of Eve, and bear a son. As their family continued, Cain built a city and named it Enoch after his firstborn son. Cain's lineage multiplied throughout many generations of children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The generations of Cain's lineage proved industrious. In the seventh generation of Cain, three men are noted for their abilities for work and ingenuity. Jabel was a father of all those who lived nomadically in tents and maintained herds of livestock. His brother Jubal was noted for his creative abilities, being described as the father of all those who played the harp and the flute. A third brother, Tubal Cain, was industrious in the production of bronze and iron implements and even the training of skilled craftsmen. These families and subsequent cultures might have been praised for their additions of knowledge and skills to humanity if it were not for the content of their character. Immorality, wickedness, rebellion, and violence were also passed through this lineage. It seems Cain, the patriarch of these many peoples, did not instill an understanding of the importance of obedience and righteousness. Though the consequences of sin followed him, a legacy of remembrance was not passed on. Rather, it was one of vengeance and wickedness. These two main lineages, that of Seth and that of Cain, 
encompassed a vast group of developing peoples. Originally, each began with very different value systems. Cain's descendants multiplied and demonstrated rebelliousness toward their Heavenly Father. Seth and his lineage embodied the values of respect and faith toward their Creator. However, over time, the pure hearts and minds of the faithful were weakened. Husbands and wives were chosen with, without any regard to the questions of their character, their faithfulness, their righteousness. The righteous sons of God in Seth's lineage were marrying the worldly descendants of Cain, whose focus was on raising daughters of men instead of daughters to God. These marriages broke the convictions of the faithful populations. This transition from families of faithfulness to families consumed by worldly desires was not immediate, but rather it, it festered within humanity, growing and spreading from generation to generation. There had been many faithful families in humanity's past, but with so many later generations compromising on their principles, the few men and women who had been faithful, they relinquished their positive influences on their children and their grandchildren, their friends and their relatives. The very foundation of God was now abandoned. Even the everyday relationships and interactions deteriorated into deceptions and thievery, maliciousness and violence. It consumed humanity until every intent of the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continually. Years after the faithfulness of Enoch had been rewarded, his great-grandson Noah was born into this struggling and morally unraveling world. Guided by his mother and his father, Noah grew up facing all the same temptations that every other young man his age was experiencing. It's reasonable to consider that Noah had every opportunity to choose a life of corruption and violence, of selfishness, personal gain, or rebellion. The opportunities were even more multiplied when we consider that at this time in history, men and women lived much longer lives, even centuries. Noah's grandfather, Methuselah, holds the distinction of being the oldest recorded man to have ever lived at 969 years. Yet despite the enormous temptations of a corrupt and pleasure-seeking world, Noah chose the straight way in obedience to God. Was Noah sinless in his actions or choices? By no means. As every man that had ever lived, Noah also sinned and fell short of God's glory. But was Noah able to stand before any man, any judge, any court, and in the face of his accusers, be without blame and above reproach? Absolutely. Noah was a man of integrity who was fair and just in his dealings with anyone. The overall character of Noah's life is recorded and described as one who walked with God. However, God when looking down on the rest of the earth, was appalled at what he saw, disgusted with the abuse of the free will he had so lovingly granted to his creation. Inspired history records a, a welling up of regret that the faithful creator felt for the direction his creation had chosen in their lives. In his justice, God proclaimed a verdict of guilt upon all those who had disobeyed his teachings. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Such a sentence of totality could only be made by the one who was responsible for it all. Would God continue to see sinful man ravage each other and degrade humanity's value? God's answer was issued. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life, 
everything that is on the earth shall die. The punishment for mankind's wickedness would simply be water, falling from the sky, springing from the ground, but it would be far greater than a spring shower. Instead, it would take the world by storm, literally, cover it completely and prevail across the globe totally. God was going to plunge the world into a worldwide flood. But with his justice, God's mercy would also be extended to Noah and the few righteous souls whose attitude and conviction for goodness, kindness, and righteousness had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God conveyed to Noah the details of the sentence that he would enact upon the earth. But with it, he also made an offer for protection. God said, I will establish my covenant with you. This covenant offered by God was one of protection and salvation from the judgment that the world deserved. But it would also place an immense responsibility on Noah. In understanding the timeline of Noah's life, it seems that this covenant with God came near the time that Noah and his wife were establishing their family, about the age of 500. Men and women of Noah's day lived very long lives, but in comparison with previous generations, Noah was a fair bit older than others, a fair bit older when his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth were born. Perhaps this age provided Noah with greater wisdom to fulfill what God would be requiring of him. Being offered protection was merciful, but how was it that Noah could avoid such a natural, all-encompassing, catastrophic flood? The flood's pronouncement was upon all flesh under heaven. There were no mountaintops to scale that would be unaffected, no distant lands to retreat to. As always, though, God's plans were not lacking. His covenant with Noah was complete, addressing both his actions and provisions, as well as what would be Noah's required duty, the making of an ark. Making an ark. It may have seemed like a simple enough task to Noah, but then again, what's an ark? In a literal sense, he understood the word to be a chest, a, a box, or a barge. But in terms of a flood, a vessel for saving his family, Noah had never heard of, seen, or, or even been inside such a thing, let alone constructed one. For that matter, Noah had never seen any catastrophic flood of water, especially comprehending enough water that could consume the lands of the entire world. But of course, God's covenant was complete, and he never left his people without proper instruction or guidance. When he made commands for his people, he always communicated to them in ways they could be properly understood. He provided resources where they could be properly obeyed. What was this barge, this box, this ark to be like? How large was it to be? What was its interior to be like? Noah was not a seasoned shipbuilder. There are no indications that he was a revered for his construction or design abilities. Yet God knew Noah's strengths and weaknesses, his areas of knowledge and ignorance. So all of the necessary details were supplied to Noah as part of the covenant God was establishing with him. For its structure, the ark was to be made of wood and lots of it. The amount of wood needed would boggle the mind because God's plans for the overall size and proportions of the ark specified that it must be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. Pitch would be used to coat the entire outside and inside of this massive structure, creating a very important waterproof barrier. Provision for light was provided, and a single door was partitioned in its side. Within the ark, God called for structural divisions that would make it useful and effective for its task. Three major decks would divide its height and provide an immense amount of usable floor space. Noah was to add many rooms or compartments, creating a means of 
orderliness and organization for the ark's passengers and its cargo. So far, God had detailed an enormous vessel. But what was going to fill all of this space? The few individuals that would be on board would scarcely need a fraction of the spacious accommodations. For God, the flood would serve as a major act of renewal, but he was not performing a recreation. The ark's immense accommodations would also be for the preservation of animal life through the representatives of the animal kinds that would be affected by a global flood. Animals which lived on land and had the breath of life in them, beasts and cattle, creeping things, birds of every kind. The final cargo would be the provisions needed for both man and animal to survive. God had provided the details necessary for Noah, and it says, thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him. During what would be many, many years of preparation, there was much more that involved Noah's time and energy than just the ark's construction. Noah was a father to three sons who were of such a faithful character that God included them to be part of the chosen few who would board the ark. Was Shem, Ham, and Japheth faithful, honest, and righteous because of the world's influence? Not at all. They were righteous and upstanding men due to the diligent and thoughtful parenting of Noah and his wife. A stark contrast to children being raised by the world. As parents, Mr. and Mrs. Noah had to provide for the daily and physical well-being of their sons, food, clothing, shelter, caring for them when they were sick and bandaging them when they were hurt. They also were highly involved and concerned with their son's spiritual growth and well-being. By necessity, this training would have included all of the essentials about obedience to God, teaching their sons about the Creator, about respect for authority, about the great importance of worship, maintaining an attitude of humility, and much, much more. Yet we know that the teaching by these parents was effective and that the sons received it well. Through the years, the family of Noah experienced all of the usual, major life experiences that modern people are familiar with. There were the aging of parents and grandparents and other family. There were undoubtedly various relatives, extended family, or neighbors who died. And these events would have evoked times of grief and sorrow. At the other extreme, there were the weddings three sons growing through adolescence to be young men who inevitably would find young ladies to be their wives. Little is known of these young women, but what is known is that they too were given a place on the ark. They were not subjected to the sentence of punishment as the world was. The implication here is that the godly influences of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the father-in-law Noah, and potentially the largest factor, their new mother-in-law, Mrs. Noah, was of such impact, so life-changing, that these young women left behind their old lives and most likely the sinfulness of their immediate families in order to render their lives in obedience to God. Had Noah, described as a preacher of righteousness, had he seen positive fruit from his holding fast to godliness? Well, in these three young couples, Mr. and Mrs. Noah saw a future of hope. Now the family was growing. More hands at work was encouraging, but the hardships were not lessening. The ark still had to be built and finished, the provisions gathered, and the opportunities to continue preaching to a lost world could not be overlooked. Noah sought to warn his generation of the coming events not knowing when the time would be fulfilled and God's long-suffering would be ending. God had said that he would not strive with man forever. When would the ark be fully prepared? When would the staging of animals be complete? Noah was not in charge of the timing. Every day for approximately 100 years, Noah and his family woke up, at times with soreness or stiffness or aches from a previous hard day's work. They had before them a choice. Would they choose to obey God and continue in their efforts? Or would they decide to forget the whole endeavor altogether? 
day after day, month after month, year after year, these eight men and women made the decision that it was crucial for them to follow God's will. Along the way, the family did have real observable encouragement for their labors. This huge structure, the ark, was progressing, coming together. It was no longer an empty frame or an odd array of posts and beams. Its exterior was almost complete, lacking only a few more sections to seal up with pitch. Each deck was taking shape with rooms and compartments, hallways and walkways, railings and cages. It was an empty place, large and expansive, with long passageways joining one end to another. But the enormous project was coming together. By no means, though, was all day, every day, spent in and on the ark. There were far too many things to gather, to acquire, to prepare, from the lumber needed and the various tools to work it, to the fasteners and bracings to complete the structure, to the food and provisions sustaining their present lives as well as the stores for their future survival. In their process and workflow, could there have been city shops or village marketplaces that Noah visited to procure goods and materials? Cities and industry most certainly existed in Noah's day, so were there not already many craftsmen, tradesmen, merchants, traders who were established in these occupations? Might Noah have utilized the resources that God had provided to acquire these things or potentially hire some assistance? Yet, even if this was not what Noah or God had in mind, Noah, his wife, three sons and their wives would have years and decades amounting to millions of man hours to press on with the tasks that were needed. As Noah went about surveying their progress, uh, assessing the projects that had been completed, one major aspect of God's covenant that Noah did not have to worry about was the gathering of animals. Those representatives, male and female, of each required animal kind came to the ark. They did not come because of Noah's call or request, but came to Noah to keep them alive. There were many years of preparation and sufficient time for the animals to complete their travel or migration to the one place, the one structure that contained God's saving covenant. Animal populations move naturally from region to region as the food supply or shelter changes. But there would be no gradual climate change or environmental signals that would announce the coming of the great flood. The world's inhabitants, rejecting God and Noah's messages, would be eating and drinking and reveling until the day the flood would take them away. As such, the coming of the animals to Noah was part of God's providential care. Though no natural indicators would be present for Noah and his family, there may have been one relative clue for the flood's imminent arrival. The ark was now finished. Its construction was complete. The stores of food for themselves and the animals were on board. Was it immediately at this time or were there days of rest and waiting? Either way, the anticipated moment came. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Noah and his family had spent many hours inside the ark, working and preparing, but this time they would enter the ark permanently, leaving their beds and homes and land behind. It was a profoundly different entrance, not to mention that once on board, the procession of animal life followed. Animals of practically every variety came creeping, crawling, slithering, hopping, marching, waddling, and even flying by pairs and sevens into the ark. God's time frame was now definite. There were no months and years to complete the boarding process. Seven days were all that would be available. This one week must have been a whirlwind of activity as the once empty ark took on life and character. No longer was it empty and hollow, echoing and 
creaking with settling wood. Rather, it was now lively and beating, filled with sounds of scurrying and squawking as the chatter of thousands of animals pulsed through the ark. Noah was now 600 years old. He had seen and experienced more than most lifetimes could ever imagine. But it seemed that the excitement was only beginning. In the second month, on the 17th day, the rains began to fall. And on that day, God himself closed the door of the ark. Its passengers, man and beast, were now safe and sheltered. So God released the downpour, opening the windows of heaven, and caused the great fountains of the deep to break forth from below. For forty days and nights, the waters came without ceasing, raining from above and rising from below. In these forty days, the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. As the waters greatly increased and prevailed across the earth, the ark moved about on the water's surface. All the high hills under heaven were covered by the exceeding waters until every mountain was submerged beneath the surface by at least 15 cubits. At last, the 40 days ended. The rain from heaven was restrained. The windows of the heavens were stopped and the fountains of the deep were sealed. Every inch of land was hidden deep beneath the waters. All life that depended on land, whether living on it or flying above it, perished. From the day the rains began and the flood waters rushed across the earth, the land stayed submerged for a total of 150 days. This period of time was sufficient for all life to be destroyed, except what could survive in the now global sea and the life that was existing within the floating ark of safety. When these first 150 days had been completed, God's remembrance was upon Noah, his family, and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided, receding continually from the earth. As the waters decreased, the ability for the bottom of the ark to clear the mountaintops also decreased, and it came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The ark's days of moving and floating with the wind and the waves was over. It was now fixed in place for the remaining duration of their stay, until Noah and his family would hear from God that the earth was again at rest. Until then, Noah could only survey their surroundings to see any progress. It would be about two and a half months of being lodged in the mountains of Ararat until the first sighting of surrounding mountains were visible, finally revealed by the receding waters. But these first sightings were only small islands of land in the midst of the surrounding waters. So Noah waited a period of 40 days before he took one of the ravens, opened a window, and released the bird into the world. The bird flew off as a, a scout for Noah. However, this particular bird never returned, but flew about on the earth until the waters were gone. So after seven days, Noah took a smaller bird, a, a female dove, and released her out the window to survey the land. The dove flew about, but found no good resting place, so she returned. Putting out his hand, Noah received her back into the ark. These two survey missions had not yielded any new information for the family. After seven more days, Noah released the dove again. What insight would they gain? What was the world outside the ark and beyond these mountains like? It wasn't long before their flitting friend returned to the ark with an encouraging sign, an olive branch. Somewhere beyond the ark, the natural processes of life and growth were being awakened by the sunlight, fresh air, and warmth. Noah would wait one more week, then send the brave little dove out again. But this journey would turn out to be her last venture from the ark, because it seems at this time she found that good resting place to begin again. After several weeks of waiting further, Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked out across the mountains of Ararat. The ground that Noah saw was dry. Now the time must be coming soon. The rain had been gone for some time. The ark was at rest. 
vegetation was coming back on the earth. The water had receded and the ground was drying. On the 27th day of the second month, just over one year after the flood had begun, God's anticipated message came. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. It was a simple command, but it had as much uncertainty as the previous command to enter the ark. How would the world be after the flood? It would definitely be different, but in what ways? Noah and his family finally opened the ark, allowing all of the animals to exit and enter into their new world. Upon exiting the ark, Noah and his family's first response was to pause and offer their thanksgiving and praise to God. From the additional clean animals that had boarded the ark, Noah sacrificed burnt offerings to God. There was much that these four couples would have to do to reestablish their lives on the earth. But for these first moments, showing their gratitude for God's care and saving mercy deserved their focus. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and spoke to the family of humanity before him. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. As in the Garden of Eden, God commanded man, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The three younger couples would spread out in the land and have many children and a multitude of descendants. Shem, Ham, and Japheth would each become the patriarchs of great nations and a diversity of people. Through Adam and Noah, all peoples and nations of the earth would come until the time that a true Savior would solve humanity's problem of sin forever. World Video Bible School has additional Bible-based resources, including hundreds of video programs on various topics that are available free online or for purchasing on DVD. These programs, along with other print and audio materials, are available at wvbs.org.